I did post yesterday, I sent a message yesterday or the day before, uh, a solution to that quick test. We got most of the way through it, but I posted that. I'm not going to do it in class because we sort of eat vectors in the head. We're going to do some more vectors as well. But you will see that on the test, so make sure that you're, you're up on that. Let's try out this question. What is the magnitude of the force on the minus 6 nanocoulomb charge? I think there's a follow-up to that. Oh, no, there's not. But what is the magnitude of that force? So I have a plus 3 nanocoulomb, in case you can't see this and a minus 6 nanocoulomb. Go ahead and ask yourself what is the direction to on that minus 6 nanocoulomb. Go and answer the first question regarding the magnitude, and then on the next question, I'll ask you what is the direction of that force on the minus six and the long bar. There'll be one of those responses. But the first question is just what is the force on the minus six and a long charge? All right, I'll stop in about 15 seconds. seconds. I think it's right. Let's see. So we're just doing Coulomb's law here. F is kq over r squared. kqq over r squared, rather. It's going to be 9 times 10 to the ninth times my two charges, 3 times 10 to the minus 9. 6 times 10 to the minus 9 divided by the distance. Now the distance here is going to be the square root of a half squared plus a half squared. Use the Pythagorean theorem. This is the halves. Oh, what is that? It was uh, 0.7? 0.7? Yeah. 0.71, I think. Just say 0.7 divided by 0.7 squared. And uh, what, did, what was the answer? Which answer was it? A. It was A. So that's 3.2 times 10 to the minus 7. Newton? All right, now try this next question. What is the direction? No, A and B are not. A and what? B. No, when I say A, here, I can rewrite it. Instead of from, we'll say above. Whenever I say from, that's going to be always measured from the positive x axis in the counterclockwise direction. seconds, stopping at 110. 
stopping at 110, 5 seconds. Okay, let's see, we're sort of spread out, but C is the right answer. Um, need to know how to pick out the directions. You will have a 2D vector problem, okay guys? And it will be more difficult than this, sort of more like what we've been doing. But make sure that you can do vectors in 2D. Um, now here, I just want to draw my vectors. I draw my coordinate system on the minus, minus 6 nanocoulomb charge. And then I draw the vector because these are opposite charges they're going to attract. And then because this is an equilateral right triangle, I know that this is 45 degrees. So one possible answer would be 45 degrees above the negative x-axis. And so I look and I see that that option is not given. And so I can look for other things because I can measure it from the minus x-axis, uh, either above or below the negative x-axis. I can have it above or below the positive x-axis. Or I can measure it from the positive x-axis. So I can measure it, say, here. And this angle will be 90 plus whatever this angle is, which is 45, which is 135 degrees. So C is the right answer. 135 degrees from the positive x-axis. That mainly that's about, um, when I say from, I mean that I'm starting at the positive x-axis and moving in a counterclockwise direction. That's pretty typical for measuring angles, is that it moves in a counterclockwise direction through quadrant one, two, three, and four. Okay, you'll definitely see a 2D problem as one of your free response. So, you know, those are worth 15-ish points. It's not, not insubstantial. Uh, let's, we'll see that one more time when we get into electric fields, because electric fields are vector quantities as well. Um, electric fields are really just something that we make up to describe the force that an object feels when it's in or around an object of either charge or mass. So we've already talked about fields with regards to the gravitational field, that the gravitational field is there. It's a tool that we use to describe the gravitational force. And in a similar way, the electric field is uh, something that we use to describe the electric force. Uh, the electric field exists in the space around a charged object. It exists in the space around a charged object. And we define the electric field in this way. We say that the electric field is defined as, that's what this sort of quasi-equal sign with three lines is defined as the force divided by a charge that we're going to call Q0. Now Q0 is a positive test charge. And when I say test, I want you to think, this is not a real charge. It's an imaginary thing. It's something that we'll use as a tool in this chapter to determine the direction of the electric field. And you'll see how that comes in. All right. uh, how that comes into play as we go along. I had a high school physics teacher, Helen Perry, and she used to always say that you carry two things in your back pocket. You always carry in your back pocket. A positive test charge and your right hand. We'll use our right hand later in the semester. If you use the right hand, we use the right hand rule last semester, and we'll see that again. You always carry your positive test charge and your right hand for the right hand rule. So make sure that you always have that with you if you'll need it. Um, I'll show you what that's for in just a bit. The units of the electric field are newtons per coulomb. But we'll also see later in the next chapter that the units of the electric field can also be volts per meter. So you might see either. But right now, because our, we're defining our electric field as force per unit charge, the, uh, we'll say that the units are newtons per coulomb, which are the units for force and charge, newtons per coulomb. But we'll see later that it will also be volts per meter. And that's sort of more standard to define it in terms of volts per meter, because um, we'll see how the electric field is defined as the partial derivative of the uh, voltage. All right, when a charge Q is within an electric field, 
the force that the charge feels is given by this uh, is just based on our definition of the electric field. The force is equal to Q times the electric field. These are vector quantities, so F and E would put arrows. And in fact, we'll see this later. I'm just going to go ahead and uh, write this off in a little thought bubble that for a positive charge, F and E are in the same direction. That's what that little arrow means. F and E will point in the same direction for a positive charge. Don't worry, we'll see that again in a few minutes. So let's try this. Um, I have a proton that's accelerated from rest in an electric field of 100 volts per meter. Or remember, that's also newtons per coulomb. What is the velocity of the proton after two seconds? And then there's the mass of the proton. And uh, what is the velocity of the proton after two seconds? A couple of things you'll need to do. You'll need to find out what is the force. And you'll need to find the acceleration. And then don't forget your kinematics equations. You could see a problem uh, regarding kinematics in this way. There's some in your homework as well. Just don't forget those two kinematics equations. They're not on your equation sheet. I'll write them here, though. It is okay when you get your test just to write it up at the top of the test. If you think you might forget those, just so to review them before you go on the test. There's not a whole lot to memorize for the test, but that's, that's one thing that you'll need to memorize. So find the force, find the acceleration, and then here we're looking for the velocity. Find the velocity. You'll need to know the charge. The charge isn't given, but you can look back in your notes if you don't remember it. wrap this up for about 10, 20, about 20 seconds. I'll stop at four minutes. So guess if you don't know, you have about three or four seconds. Okay.
Okay, B is right. So I would first find the force. In order to find that, I'll need to know what is the charge. This is a proton, so it has a fundamental unit of charge. 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And then my electric field is 100 newtons per coulomb or volts per meter. Those cancel, leaving me just with newtons. So that is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 17 newtons. And then I want to find my acceleration. That's F over M for Newton's second law. Again, not something that I would give you on the uh, on the exam, but I think I think you all know that. Um, that is, you know, Newton's second law. Newtons divided by the mass, which is 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27. Uh, I can just say this is like 10 to the 10th. I'm just going to sort of round that off and call it 10 to the 10th. And then I want to know the velocity after two seconds. So the velocity after two seconds is V is equal to A times T. A is 10 to the 10th. T is 2, so it should be 2 times 10 to the 10th, which is B. That is right, right? Yeah. Okay. So some basic kinematics. You're not going to see terribly difficult kinematics, but you do have some problems in your homework uh, regarding, I think there's like an inkjet printer, where uh, you can calculate the speed of the, the inkjets as they go through the electric field. Okay, so um, we can have a different expression for the electric field. The electric field is really just based on Coulomb's law. How we determine the electric field is based on Coulomb's law. Because Coulomb's law is really the underlying law regarding all these equations. We just use the electric field to describe the force that a charge feels. So Coulomb's law gives the force between the charge Q and the test charge. Remember Coulomb's law was F equals K Q Q over r squared, but now we're going to have a q naught here. So remember, this is our imaginary test charge. But we're just going to use it to help derive an expression for the electric field. Um, now, also remember that we define our electric field as the force per unit charge, q naught. And so we can just combine these expressions where I just take this and plug it in for f and I get an expression for the electric field. And it looks like this is going to be KQ over R squared. So this is my electric field, or at least the magnitude of my electric field, KQ over R squared. That is on your equation sheet. Uh, we'll find the direction of the electric field. Or first, let me just remind you what these are. K is our Coulomb's constant. And it has a value of 9 times 10 to the 9th uh, Newton meter squared over Coulomb squared. Uh, Q, again, is measured in Coulombs. And R is measured in meters. So that's, if I have a charge, Q, what this is saying is, is that some point, some distance, R from that charge, the electric field at that point is equal to kq over r squared. So unlike with Coulomb's law, where we were talking about the force between two charges, when we calculate the electric field, there's really only one charge that's involved. Now notice here that this imaginary test charge, that when we actually calculate what is our electric field, that test charge, even though we used it to define the electric field, it no longer is in that equation, which is a good thing because it's just imaginary. We just make it up. So it shouldn't have any physical ramification. It doesn't. It doesn't affect the electric field. It's just something that we use in our minds that we carry around in our back pocket to imagine what would this electric field be like. Okay? This weekend when you're out at the parade or whatever it is to do in the weekend, you should pull out your electric charge and say, hey, look at my imaginary test charge. It's not, a, it's not a negative charge, it's a positive test charge. So make sure that you tell your friends that. Because then, like, they'll feel an affinity towards you, and they'll think that you're cooler than you actually are. Like, did I just say that? They'll think that you're cool. All right?
Okay, so the sign of the charge Q determines the direction of the electric field. That is not the test charge, but the actual charge. The direction of the electric field is... I think you skipped a little bit. I'm sorry. Okay, so yeah, the E field, I said this in order, but let's put it out, write it out. The E field is not dependent upon the test charge. The, uh, the test charge, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the test charge is only a tool. to measure or sample the E field. Not even really to measure, but more to think about the electric field. What is the electric field? I never really understood the test charge. Do you all understand it? I mean, I understand it now. We'll practice with it a little bit, okay? Now, it, you'll sort of see the purpose of it. It's really just something to help you determine the direction of the electric field. So the sign of the charge Q determines the direction of the electric field. The direction of the electric field is the same direction as the force felt by the positive test charge. So for example, if I have a positive test charge here, here's my positive charge, I have a positive test charge, what's the direction that the force that this positive test charge is going to feel, to the left or right? It's going to feel a force to the right because these are light charges and they'll repel. So my force on this positive test charge will be in this direction. Now my electric field, on the other hand, or in the same hand, I guess, will be in the same direction. So my electric field is in the same direction as the force. And in fact, we'll get into electric field lines, though if you're in the lab, you've already seen that. We're going to represent the electric field as a field line. And that's what we saw it last, last chapter. Now, similarly, if I have a negative charge here, and I want to draw the force, the force on this positive test charge, because it's positive and they're opposite charges, they'll attract. And so the force is in that direction. And so the electric field will also be in the same direction. So if ever we want to know the direction of the electric field, in a similar way as we did with Coulomb's law, we imagine a positive test charge and ask ourselves, what is the, the direction of the force that the positive test charge will feel? We can also do the superposition principle. So if we have two charges, here, I have two charges. My positive test charge is right here. The electric field, let's see, which one is the one that I've drawn here? Is it E1 or E2? This is E2. Because I imagine, what is the direction of the force that this part would feel due to this part? And it would be to the left. And then I ask, well, what is the direction of the force that this part will feel due to this part? And it's going to be to the right because they're like charges. So E1 is in this direction, E2 is to the left. So at some point we'll just stop drawing that imaginary test charge because we're really just worried about the electric field at a particular point in space. And so I'll have an E1 here and E2 here. And then the net electric field is just the vector sum. So the electric field it's just going to be E1, the magnitude of the electric field will be E1 minus E2, the vector sum. And in this case, the vector sum is just the arithmetic sum because they're all along the x-axis. We don't have to worry about doing, uh, you know, <coughs> sines, cosines, tans, all that jazz. 
So if the charges Q1 and Q2 are identical, the electric field is zero. Because these two would have equal, uh, equal magnitudes and they would just cancel out. That's assuming what? Not only that Q1 and Q2 have the same magnitude of charge, but what else? Right, the same distance between them both. Because I would calculate the magnitude for E1 and E2. E1 would equal KQ1 over R squared, and E2 would be KQ2 over R squared. So R and Q would have to be identical for the two electric fields to be identical. We can uh, also do this in two or three dimensions. We'll just do it in two dimensions. May I go down from here, y'all? Let's see, before we get into this, I want to show you a little video because you're probably wondering, well, gosh, what are electric fields really useful for? And they actually, when we get into circuits, we're not going to, well, we will talk about it a little bit about how the electric field can, you can move, use to move charges around. And so in circuits, when we think about circuits, it's really we have an electric field set up within our conductor, within the wire or whatever it might be. And that's what moves the charges around, these electric fields that are set up within the wires. Uh, electric fields can be used to direct charges in various applications. And you know, like in, the, for example, a, uh, a spectrometer, in some spectrometer, like a mass spectrometer, but you also use magnetic fields. And we'll see that in chapter five, that we use them to, to direct charged particles and we can tell by how the particle moves what is its charge based on the electric field that it experiences. Uh, there are also some medical applications for, for electric fields, and I want to show you that now. It's a video, it's a TED Talk, it's actually a TED Med Talk. You ever watch TED Talks? Yeah, they're really cool. But um, this is a, a researcher talking about electric fields and how they're being used to treat cancer, to, to impede the cell division of cancer cells. Everybody's been touched by cancer in one way or another, probably everybody in this room. So it's really exciting to think that, you know, you can come up with a new treatment for something that's been around for, well, as long as we've been around, I guess. So let's watch this. Let me pull it up. That's really interesting, huh? Yes, that was very interesting. Uh, it's pretty easy to generate an electric field. In fact, y'all did that in the lab, right? In that very first lab, you generate an electric field. You just take two leads, hook them up to a power supply, and then connect them to some conductive material, and it sets up an electric field between those two conducting plates or whatever it is. So very simple to set up an electric field. In fact, very simple to set up a very targeted electric field. We're quite good at that. So we've been doing it for, you know, I don't know, 100 years or more. Uh, but it's cool to see a new application of that. Let's see, where were we? Okay, so let's do this. Uh, this is going to be another 2D vector problem. I know we've done this a couple times, but just as one last practice of this, because uh, electric fields are vector quantities and we have to treat them as such. Just let me remind you of the steps. The first step that we'll do is draw the E field vectors. The second step uh, either we can find the direction of the E-field vectors or the magnitudes. Let's do the magnitudes next. The third step will be the direction of the E-field vectors. If they're not on axis, then we'll find that we have one not on axis. The fourth will be to find the X and the Y components of the E-field vectors. The fifth step will be to sum up the forces in the X direction, sum up the forces in the Y direction, and then the sixth step will be to find the magnitude and direction, sorry, not the forces, the E field in the X and Y direction. Find the magnitude and the direction of our resultant vector, which we'll just call it E. So we have those steps that we're going to follow. Had the exact same steps for the Coulomb's law problem that we did last time. So in order to find to draw my electric field vectors, I want to know the electric field at this point. I imagine that I have a positive test charge. You can draw it if you like. 
the positive test charge, then I ask myself, what would be the direction of the force on my positive test charge due to this Q1? And since that Q1 is positive, that force, or excuse me, the force would be in that direction. So E1 is also in that direction. Then I can find the direction of the field or the force that a positive test charge would feel due to that charge, and it will be in that direction. So that will also be the direction of E2. The direction of the force is the same as the direction of the electric field. Now I need to find the magnitudes. E1 is KQ1 over R squared. That's going to be, remember, E is KQ over R squared. So this is going to be 9 times 10 to the ninth times Q, which is 3 times 10 to the minus 9, divided by R squared. I need to know what R squared is. Noticing that I have a right triangle here. Uh, this is a special triangle, a 3, 4, 5 triangle, but I could use the Pythagorean theorem to find that distance, but I'll have 5 squared there. Notice I have some cancellations, that 10 to the plus 9, 10 to the minus 9, so I'm looking at 27 over 25 newtons per coulomb. I get 1.08. I'll keep all six things for now. Okay, that's in newtons per coulomb. And then in a similar way, I find E2, the magnitude of E2. It's going to be 90 to the 9. 2 times 10 to the minus 9 divided by 4 squared. 4 is the distance between Q2 and the point where I want to know this electric field. That is going to be 18 over 16. 1.125. So those are the magnitudes of those two electric field vectors. Now my next step is to find the direction of E1. E2 is on the negative x-axis, so I don't need to worry about that. But I want to know what is this angle theta. Notice I have two lines here. A line there and a line there on that angle theta, these two angles are exactly the same. This is a 3, 4, 5 triangle, so this angle is 37 degrees, but I could find that, if I wasn't sure, or if it was just a funky triangle, I could say that the tangent of theta is opposite over adjacent, so Katoa, 3 over 4, so theta is the inverse tan of 3 over 4, which is 37 degrees. I know there are probably a handful of y'all that still have trouble with these trig functions. If that's the case, please come see me. I can sit down with you and we'll get it all sorted out. Okay? So if you're still having trouble with that, please come see me on how to determine how to do that right angle trigonometry and the little bit of geometry that we'll use. All right, so that's the direction of E. We only had to find E1 in this case. Now, I want to find the x and y components of E1. I don't need to worry about E2 because it's only on the x axis. So E1x will be 1.08 cosine of my angle, which is 37 degrees. And E1y will be 1.08 sine of 37. Keeping it in the degree mode on your calculator, this is going to be 0.86 newtons per coulomb, and this is going to be 0.65 newtons per coulomb. So I'm up to here. I've done my x and y components. Now I like to draw my vectors now just so I sort of know what's going on. 
I have E2 in this direction. E2 is 1.125. E1x is in this direction. It is 0.86. And then E2y, or excuse me, E1y is 0.65. So those are the three vectors. These are all in Newtons per Coulomb, but those are my three vectors that I'm dealing with. I want to take a vector sum. That means that I need to do the sum of the forces in the x and the y direction. So let's do that. I don't have any other vectors but the 0.65, so it's just going to be 0.65 in this direction. And now I have these two vectors. Is my net vector going to be positive or negative? be negative. I'll do 0.86 minus 1.125 in order to find the sum of those two vectors. So that's going to be negative 0.265. So it's going to be in this direction. So that does this step, number five. And then the final step, I always like to redraw it because it helps me to think more better about it, but I have that 0.265 vector right here and the 0.65 vector right here. My coordinate system is still like that. Okay, and then the resultant vector will be like that. I want to know the length and direction of that vector, and then I'll be done. That's a right triangle, so to find the magnitude of E, Say the square root of 0.65 squared plus 0.265 squared I get 0.7 newtons per coulomb or volts per meter and then if I want to know the angle Say so this angle, I'll call it theta. I say theta is the inverse tan of the y component over the x component, opposite over adjacent, so Katoa, 0.65 over 0.265. I get 68 degrees. Uh, but we need to qualify it that 68 above the negative x axis. That's the answer. That's the net electric field at that point. There's a homework problem like that, too. That's a little bit different. Okie dokie. I know that was kind of fast, but we started a couple of times already. So. Okay. Now I'll see how this last picture goes on fast. We'll see some other things, too, of course. We'll talk about that next week. Um, Can I go down from here, y'all? Oh, just a minute. Yeah, look really excited about this. Are you? Most of you, the engineers, of course, you'll take all other courses on vector analysis, but so that's sort of the reason I want to harp it into you because, you know, some of you, I mean, that'd be your whole, your whole life. That sounds exciting, doesn't it? <laughs> it's actually pretty cool. Okay, let's see. I think I've. Is this a clicker question? Can I go down? All right. Let's try this clicker question. In this figure, two charges are separated by a distance d. The point A here in the middle is equidistant between these two charges. So this is d over 2, d over 2. Uh, the point B is a distance d over 2 from the rightmost charge. Where is the electric field greatest in magnitude? At point A or at point B? Do they have the same magnitude electric field? Or does it depend upon that distance d?
Let's stop at a 140, 140. right let's mark it there when you encounter these problems you just draw out your vectors and not only draw out your vectors but try to draw them out in a way so that the vectors have relative strengths appropriately let me show you what I mean by that so if I draw here at point A at point A the electric field due to this charge it's going to be uh, in that direction so remember electric field is kq over r squared so when I draw the electric field due to this charge it's going to be in the same direction is it going to be bigger or smaller the vector it's going to be bigger by what amount it's going to be double right so it'll be twice as long so the electric field there will be twice as long the reason because the charge is twice as big and if I have a charge that's twice as big then the electric field is twice as big now over here at B, I can draw the vector due to this charge. It's going to be bitty bitty, all right? And then the other one is going to be in this direction. It will be the same length as it was over here. These two vectors are the same, except they're just in opposite directions because they're equidistant from the same charge, all right? So clearly, then, A has a longer vector. The sum of those two vectors is bigger. Now let's think about this a little bit because this could come up with other problems. How much different is this vector from this vector? Let's actually do that as a clicker question. So I'm going to give you some options. Uh, it's clearly smaller, but is it uh, one third small, one quarter as small, uh, one sixth as small, one sixteenth as small, or uh, uh, one ninth as small? So what is the relative length of this vector to this vector? The, comparing the two blue vectors, by how much smaller is that one on the right to the one on the left? Clean this up a little bit, a little more space. I'll stop in just a moment at, at uh, 48, 48. Okay, a lot of you put B, but B is not right. But I understand why you would put B, and you're sort of thinking in the wrong, in the in the in the correct direction. You're thinking this point is twice as far away from that charge as this point. Isn't that what you're thinking? Because you're going to put B. But it's not twice as far away. Right? It's how much further away? It's three times as far away. Let me show you. So if you put in numbers, it sort of makes more sense. Um, like let's say that, that this distance is one meter. That means that this distance is two meters. That means that this distance is three meters. So three meters is three times one meter, right? So it's three times the distance. And so if I think about my electric field, kq over r squared, if this is three times as big, that means that my electric field is one ninth as big. So E is the right answer there. OK? All right, folks, well, listen, our test is only going to cover chapters 0 and 1 if you want to start preparing. We might get to chapter 0.5, but it won't be on the exam. And we will have a derivation where you'll fill it, where you'll do a derivation beforehand and turn it in at that time after you have the test. But more about that next week, okay? But only chapters 0 and 1 if you want to study it. Have a great weekend.